Hi friends and happy Pride Month. Whenever you're listening to this episode on Spotify, because for us, Pride really is 365 days a year. Welcome to our Pride Month special Shine Takeover episode on FYI, the Backstory podcast. Shine is Backstory's LGBTQIA plus and allies network, and we're on a mission to create the most inclusive culture in hospitality. And this conversation is part of our commitment to shine a light on community voices and experiences that create opportunities for learning both in and outside our business. I'm Sean Marks, I go by the pronouns he, they, and I'm your host for this episode, creating an LGBTQIA plus inclusive culture. And today I'm joined by two awesome humans, Daniel Stewart, resourcing manager and co-chair of our Shine London Hub, and Matt Webb, who is not only an awesome account director within Baxter Story, but is also a council member and chair of the Game Leadership Inclusion and Diversity Group at England Rugby, working to ensure that rugby becomes the most inclusive and welcoming of sports. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll be diving into their individual experiences and perspectives on creating inclusive cultures, together discussing why inclusion matters in workplaces, sports and society at large, how we can build inclusive cultures and the important role that leadership and advocacy play as part of that. Our wish is that this conversation will help ignite you to have further conversations and take actions towards greater inclusion wherever you are. First of all, a big thank you, Dan and Matt, for joining. Good morning. Thank you Thanks for Thanks. having us. Good morning. <laughs> so I want to start this conversation finding out a little bit about your story. So, Dan, I'm going to start off with you first. You've been with Baxter Story for 22 and a half years now. Tell us a right. little bit about your career journey and what fuels your drive to create inclusion in the work that you do. Thanks, John. Um, to be able to answer that, we need to go back to 35 years ago when I first started in hospitality. <laughs> um, I lived in a godforsaken town in northeast of England. And it was about the time that I was 15 that I decided I was trying to work out where I was going to have work experience. Mm. And at that point, there wasn't really anything that appealed to me. And what was left on the right at the bottom of the list was um, hotel and catering. And I decided to take that and instantly fell in love, instantly realized that's my people Mm. and that's my place to be. And so I worked around in a number of places and ended up running a bar in the center of this city. And I I loved it. I absolutely loved what I was doing. And over the 30 years that I progressed within the, the bar, I'm, I ended up being the manager. And I managed the place. It's a bar and a restaurant for seven years. And if you think about um, a transient town full of university students, I met all sorts of walks of life. People mm. that I interviewed came from overseas, came from all parts of the country, came from different backgrounds. And I met such a diverse and, and um, interesting, fabulous group of people. And what I wanted to ensure I created was an environment where they all felt comfortable to be themselves, to be safe, to be express themselves however they wanted to do, um, to just be the humans that they want to be, but also realize their potential yeah. at the same time. And it was a joy to, to see how that impacted the business. Mm. But yeah, by creating an inclusive and diverse workforce um, we became the most popular bar, and that's no mean feat considering this place has bars on every corner. No, exactly. Um, so it worked incredibly well. Um, and I carried that with me. So when I moved to London, um, I and started working for Houston and Church, which is obviously now back to the story. Uh, I, was, I was adamant that I was going to create the same environment around me, and mm-hmm. I hope that I did that as a, as a general manager and then as an operator, operations manager, accounts director. I hope that I did that um, by be creating uh, an inclusive and safe and, and um, prosperous work environment. Um, but two years ago, um, after the COVID hit, um, <laughs> I, I was the asked if I'd take COVID. on the result. I know the joy of COVID. <laughs> um, but out of that, I mean, it was a horrible experience, and I, and I, I don't want to say anything more than that on it, but it, it was, it, some things have come out of it that then changes the world. Yeah. And this was something that I was key. I really wanted to be part of um, creating a much more inclusive culture. I realized that I'd done that within my environment, I hope, but I didn't do it widespread. It wasn't as widespread as it could mm. be. And whilst we are um, a really diverse workforce, considering the Europeans, the people that are transient that have come in, it, we were, I, I didn't always see representation of everybody within yeah. the business. And when you then suddenly have a... Um, uh, the tragedy of COVID and the tragedy of Brexit, we're then looking to find our workforces. 
suddenly and, and we just don't have the transient people that we used to have anymore. So you look elsewhere. But as you're doing that, those creating an inclusive and safe environment and representational environment for people to be able to see it, they would want to come and join us. And we're looking for people from all walks of life now to come and join hospitality. You don't need experience. You just need to have the right attitude. People aren't going to have the right attitude if they don't feel like they're working in a safe, inclusive, a representational environment. 63% of job seekers would not go to a company if they if they didn't feel that company had an inclusive um, yeah. cost. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, that's a scary statistic for that 63%. Um, mm. You know, particularly when you think for LGBTQ us people, you know, 18% who are looking for work have been discriminated because of their identity while trying to find a job. So, um, no, you know, the, the, that, that real important role that businesses play in ensuring that from the very beginning before persons even join they are demonstrating their inclusive cultures and they actually live and breathe them when that person joins also absolutely that's kind of what we, we're doing in the strategizing when you look at recruitment and you look at how we're going to be recruiting you look at everything from the images yeah. that we use in our adverts to the wording that we use um or where we position our adverts to where we place our adverts um so I, it, it's trying to drive through that. Um, it, it really is being able to see yourself or a representation of yourself or a version of yourself or, or at least some part of you represented somewhere within a company. Then you yep. feel, okay, I, I, I feel like that's somewhere that I can give my best work. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and Matt, I'm going to come to you next because you know, outside of that story, you've been working really hard as a champion of LGBTQIA plus inclusion in sports, particularly rugby. Um, tell us a little bit about this part of your story and what led you to the work that you do today in England rugby. So the, what led me to the work with England rugby, I guess, started back in my hospitality days and, and, and working in this industry. Um, young 20 something year old moved into London the big smoke had run some restaurants out in Surrey um and and sort of wanted to see if I could actually make it and join the big hospitality sort of buzz that was London um moved into London was out to uh selection of friends but certainly not to a close family um or anybody linked with family at that time I moved into London and sort of wanted to prove myself and it was all about sort of that young you know, uh, manager trying to get his foot on the ladder and, and, and climb a career ladder. Um, and and, and I, I struggled immensely um, with being comfortable with myself and being authentic at that point. I mean, it was, you know, what was it, two, the mid 2000s? It wasn't, you know, that long ago, but still mm-hmm. felt that at that point, you know, I didn't want to be defined by my sexuality. I didn't want to be defined by who, you know, I loved. I didn't want, you know, it to, I felt it could, you know, hold me back in my career. I felt, you know, people may not make, you know, choose me for that promotion or choose me for that location if they felt I wasn't right because I wasn't that sort of person. And I think it was really important that, you know, I look back on that with regret in the fact that I couldn't actually just be authentic and be myself. Yeah. So, that journey started and obviously I worked through my my sort of issues with that and I kept going but you know still had problems all the way up into my mid 30s um and you know wasn't really comfortable in, in a lot of ways I certainly wasn't out to my family at that point um move on to moving to Baxter Story uh, which I'm sort of eight years in now and and it was more of a m- Monday to Friday work job which gave me some work-life balance which is lovely to have having worked in restaurants and bars most of my life mm-hmm. and um, needed a new social circle. Most of my friends had moved out of London to have get mortgages and have kids and, you know, move on with their lives, need a new social circle. I'd always been a fan of rugby and played at school and enjoyed going on Six Nations and watching and drinking beer and all that sort of stuff. But it was it was to say, <laughs> well, I'll go down. I'll 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 have a uh, I'll have a little go, a little run around, have a beer, have a chat, maybe make some new friends. I absolutely fell back in love with it. I mean, they knew I played before, mm-hmm. so they put me straight into the front row and made me play again, um, which was you know, a bit daunting at the time. But actually, <laughs> eight years in, it was where I found uh, a home in rugby. I mean, seeing the fact that I came from a place where I felt you know, very isolated, didn't really have a big friendship group in the gay you know, queer community, um, and suddenly found you know this club that had over 100 plus you know gay rugby players uh, all interested in the same thing as me all, a lot of similar stories to me uh, who could be their authentic selves and were out there living their lives and I was just thought this is what you can be this is who you should be and why aren't you doing this so it gave me a, an immense amount of confidence 
Um, and, and it was that confidence and it was rugby that then allowed me to sort of come out to my family, come out to, you know, those who hadn't come out to and actually start living properly, authentically. But I think, you know, moving that on, it's really important that, you know, I now help give that back to the other people, um, yeah. you know, team sports, as well as work. You know, a lot of people find, you know, their, their home and their belonging in work, you know, but team sports specifically, you know, especially for the community where, you know, we've run away from team. I remember PE back in the day at school where, you know, you'd hide at the back and avoid it. Like I, remember, and, I remember hiding. <laughs> and it's just like, where, how, can, how can I get out of this? Well, what asthma attack can I fake today? You know, it was, uh, it was, it was, you know, it was awful by the time, but, but it's, but now, you know, having that sense of community, having a team sport um, has really helped so many people. And we hear stories within the, the Kings Cross Steelers, who I'm a sort of player and coach and former chair of now is, you know, it's about those stories stories that people have moved to London, found a community, found a hobby, found sport, found, you know, a, you know, travel, you know, found everything with it. And it's great. And we need to keep building on that. And rugby should be like that no matter where you go. You shouldn't have to go to specifically to a club that's set up for the LGBTQ plus community. You know, we want anybody to be able to go to any rugby club in the country and be able to feel belonging and included and welcome. Um, you know, when I was younger in rugby, they used to talk about, oh, we don't care what you do in the sheets. It's, you know, what you do on the pitch that counts. It was like, well, I don't ask you to care what I do in the sheets. I don't want you to talk about what I'm doing in the sheets. But I also want to be able to bring my partner down and hold hands on the side of the pitch or give them a peck on the cheek, you know, in the bar without yeah. somebody giving you some glaring look. You know, it's about that, you know, uh, that, that belonging, I guess. And that's a key word, I think, for both work and sport and society is about people should be able to feel like they belong. Yeah, belong and bring and bring their full selves to wherever they are. And and I, I love that both of you talked around the power that when teams are inclusive and diverse, they have on creating a, an incredible culture within the team, but equally the power that, you know, it gave you, Matt, to give you the confidence to step into who you are and be who you are in an authentic way, which is amazing. Um, and I love that both of you kind of plead into that word belonging, because for me, that word belonging is so important. Um, and that's really, for me, at the heart of inclusion. For anyone that knows me, I'm obsessed with Brené Brown. And I love that what she says about belonging in her book, Atlas of the Heart, she says that True belonging doesn't require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. And it makes ex makes me think of experiences that people have, including myself, I speak about it quite a lot in how I assess how inclusive a culture is by asking those questions, you know, how much can I be me? And if I can't be who I am, do I truly belong? Um, it's interesting, Matt, that you found that inclusion within rugby because traditionally, and I sit very much outside of sports and I, I ran away in PE, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I probably still run away from sports to this day. And part of that is some of my assumptions around some of those environments not being so inclusive. And so with that work that you're doing to create more belonging in rugby outside of the LGBTQ bus lead, um, how are you approaching that? What are you doing to build a more inclusive culture? I think it's about uh, education. I think it's about making you feel more comfortable. And, um, you know, rugby specifically is a very uh, monochromatic uh, sport in the way that it's run. You know, the mm. leaders in rugby are all from a very specific sort of, you know, demographic. Not not 100 percent, but in general, the majority are, you know, that sort of, um, you know, cis man, white, you know, middle aged to elderly have the time to volunteer, you know, and that's a really crucial piece is uh, volunteering mm. is, is a really difficult thing to do. And, um, and we record this in National Volunteers Week. And I think it's important that, you know, we recognise those people do a lot of work. Yeah. But ultimately, they also, uh, you know, being sort of society moves on and it's difficult for everyone to keep track and run on with society. Um, and I think it's important that we give that there's an element of education there that sort of talks about, you know, what they can do and how they can help and make people feel included. I mean, the key message that we put out around rugby specifically, and this works as well in, in business and recruitment, is that, it, you know, if you need more people, you need more players on the pitch, you need more volunteers running the bars and running the, the clubhouses, then you need to make sure that you're an environment and a club that people want to be involved in um, yeah. and want to go to, uh, which means you need to feel like you're inclusive. And that's not just for the LGBTQ plus community. It's for those from you know, ethnic diverse uh, backgrounds, you know, with, with different religious backgrounds, those, you know, we have, you know, uh, sort of socioeconomic problems and, and, you know, and, and have come from a very different background there and feel like rugby is the game for posh people and can't play it. You know, yeah. How are you, you know, going out there and showing that as a club, everybody is welcome and everybody is is free to be themselves. And I think that's really 
key. There's, there's things we do, we take bits we do, and the clubs are the most successful, the ones that will have a pride theme weekend, you know, and you're seeing that now in sort of like professional sports, premiership rugby, the Harlequins, mm. who I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, I've got my Harlequins pride mug. They run a, <laughs> they're, they're the only sort of rug, you know, premiership rugby club who's run a pride week uh, and sort of did a themed, you know, not themed, but it sounds like it's a party, it's not, but done a, but done a sort of, you know, event where they celebrate their LGBTQ plus fans and you know, players as well. And I think, you know, the visibility is the key point, showing showing that those people are there, showing people are welcome. And, and that's really, really key. There's some structured pieces as well. One of the things I really believe in is being an active ally and also yep. um, doing a lot of stuff around that. So we run and I've been part of you know, developing a program called the Active Bystander Training, which is used in two different ways within England rugby. Uh, so it's one, it's used as a proactive tool to teach people how to be, uh, you know, active in sort of supporting, you know, uh, minority groups. And mm -hmm. you know, if they are standing at the side of the pitch and they hear somebody say something that's not appropriate, how to deal with that, how to, mm. you know, bring them out, use, use, you know, different ways of sort of, kind of you know, confronting you know, and I say confronting, not in an aggressive way, there are different ways. You can either be quite a direct confronter and say that's not on, or you have to sort of, dive, you know, delegate it away to somebody else, or you have to sort of just, you know, change the topic to then come back to it at later times. There's ways of doing it that, you know, are important. And we've out there training rugby clubs and fans and leaders of rugby clubs how they can do that. But it's also used in a sort of, not a punitive, but as an educational tool as part of the discipline process. Mm -hmm. Rugby is very much about discipline. You still call the referee sir. There's no arguing back to the referee. Um, and you uh, go in there and you sort of say, well, if there are issues and it's you know, one that you can't identify an individual as being specifically doing, then you can sit the whole team down and put them through this training to make them understand the impact of what sort of the, some of the language that they're using says. And, and the Steelers have had to report teams to the RFU for homophobic abuse and uh, on the pitch and they've had to sit through this training in order to be able to continue in their league so so I guess you know summarizing it, it's, it's, it's training it's education it's sharing what's continuously changing and what's new and how people can be more inclusive how people can sort of support it's also then using you know, uh, examples of visibility showing best case best practice and I guess after that, then it's also using and having tools at your hand to how you deal with you know, issues and scenarios that come up. And I think all of that in sport equally measures through into, into business, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, that's so important. What you're saying there also is not not just about the education, the training and, and the visibility of, you know, representing themed days and, and so, so, such. It's actually the action of when something happens that maybe takes away from somebody feeling safe in that environment that something's actually done and there's a real yes. process and uh, intention behind ensuring that everyone feels and say feel safe and so that inclusivity is kind of maintained because um, you know often people think about we build inclusivity and then we don't think about it again actually it's something that requires constant maintenance and constant conversation and I know Dan in you know earlier on in our conversation you talked about the need for safe spaces and creating those safe mm. spaces um, and you know, it's interesting when you look at some of the data from Stonewall there's still a high percentage of LGBT plus employees between you know 20 35 percent of LGBT plus employees 26 percent of trans people 37 percent of non-binary people who still aren't out at work for that fear of discrimination because they don't have that safe space. So Dan, I'm curious from your experience, what do we need to do to build and increase the size of safe spaces in businesses? We are changing the narrative, I think, um, of, of what the narrative has been in the past. Um, picking up on what Matt said about visibility, uh, I, I pretty much spent most of my youth, until I moved to London, to be fair, which was 20 years ago, mm. um, feeling invisible, never visible. Mm. I was invisible, but I put, I put myself in an invisible place because it was the safest place to be. Not only was I um, brown, um, I was also of ambiguous sexuality. And, and that two things that you're kind of going there in a, in a town that doesn't see, I didn't see any other representation of that. I didn't see any other reflection of it. And I didn't have any people to, to, to be around. I think what's really important is ensuring that we have representation within the business and it's seen and it's visible. Yep. Um, representation, if it's there, we consider more. 
we consider more perspectives. We, when we're creating um, uh, strategies for the business or how we're moving the business forward or how we're creating um, the, the environments that we want to be able to create, we want mm. to draw in the right talent. And there's hugely talented people out there who are maybe passing, passing us by because they don't see anything that represents them within, within the industry. So creating those sort of safe spaces to be able to be who you are takes everybody's effort to be involved in it. It's not just going to be a few people that are going to try and pioneer this. It has to be everyone that gets on board um, and, and creates that environment in the, lo- in, in the um, locations that we have, in the support functions that we have. It needs to be visible everywhere. So to do that, um, that has to be the imagery that we use, the, the wording that we use uh, in adverts, the wording that we use in any any kind of um, advertising that we do, um, all the images, the videos, everything that we do needs to, you need to feel like you can see yourself there. Or mm-hmm. if you don't see yourself there, you feel that it's, you can be yourself there. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Matt, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, I'd add into that as well. I think it's the responsibility of leaders and the leaders of the business mm-hmm. to to ask questions and not make assumptions. Um, as I, as I sort of said before, and I think a lot of people in the community, in the LGBTQ plus community will say, you don't come out once, you have to come out dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Yeah. So every time you change company, every time you change location, every time you employ a new team member or get a new boss, you have to go through that process. That's something that, you know, you know people um, in general don't have to sort of think about or have to do as well. So making yep. the assumptions that some some leaders may make about people, you know, going up to them at the sort of a coffee morning and saying, oh, you know, how's your wife, how's your partner? You know, you know think about the wording you use, think about how that's created. Um, but it's, it's about asking questions specifically and what's going to help and support and make somebody feel comfortable. Use Shine uh, as, a, as a platform to speak to and ask about that if you want to learn more. But also just in general, if you have people in the community, I'd rather somebody ask me questions about, you know, me rather than just sort of making an assumption. You know, it's a silly thing. And it was a nice thing that somebody tried to do is that I got a Christmas card one year from back to story a few years back. Um, and it was to, to Matt and Robert, you know, Merry Christmas. Thank you for your hard work, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it turns out somebody had made an assumption and they thought like, they knew me. They didn't really know me. They hadn't asked the question and they put my dad down as my partner on my Christmas card because <laughs> my dad was my dad was Mexican. Lovely. I'm single, you know, between rugby and work, I don't have time for a, a sort of a, a love life, apparently. But um, it was very much, you know, somebody made that assumption that, oh, well, we have Matt's, Matt's, Matt's gay. So, oh, well, some Robert Webb on this, it must be. So ask questions because that sort of thing, whilst it was nice mm. that somebody had tried, it also was a bit, well, if somebody just asked me, you know, and they you know, knew me better, you know, then that wouldn't be such an issue. And I think, you know, that's that's that that piece, that assumptions that people make, because you go in there and you use language that, you know, assumes a c- certain point of view. You know, you ask language, you ask questions that assumes a certain perspective, a certain lived experience. And if people do that, then it you, you then you. you you always have to go through that sort of coming out piece again, but also just that sort of internalized bit of shame still. I mean, I think it, you yeah. know, it's mm. no matter how comfortable and out you are and, and how much you talk about it. I mean, I've been on national television talking about being out and being gay and being rugby, you know, but yet still, you know, somebody says, oh, uh, do you have a girlfriend? I suddenly go, oh, oh, oh and, and, you know, and you suddenly sort of go, why am I, why am I struggling with this question still? And it just becomes a bit mm. daft. So I think leadership is really key. And I think the leaders of the business are responsible for creating the safe space by leading by example by using you know not assuming anything asking questions and and using language that isn't going to put people in a position where they feel like suddenly under pressure to have to yeah. go through each yeah. another variation of coming out yeah i also think it's important to know just to add on to that bit as well is that you don't have to come out you just need to you can be yourself very important to say you you can be part of a community but you don't have to have to put your stamp on it or tell everybody what you're all about it's just being able to feel safe and yeah. uh, inclusive in an environment where you can be yourself that's the yeah. most important thing for me yeah because there's also that part of um you know even 
even if you don't identify, uh, you know, as LGBTQI+, there's still gender expression. And I think that mm. more and more people you see in the wider world are expressing themselves through their clothing and, and through the way that they choose to style themselves in ways that people would stereotypically kind of class or kind of assume mm. as a background for somebody. And I love that that's been challenged a bit now. And I'd love to see more of that in spaces where people challenge the status quo on, you know, what Absolutely. we should, shouldn't be wearing and expressing ourselves. Matt, go back to... 10 years ago or eight years ago when you joined, there's no way we couldn't wear ties and suits and jackets and this kind of thing. And look at how it is now. It's, yeah. Culture can change. You embrace it and you have to be all be part of that change and want to change it as well. So we can do it with ties. We can do it with it. Yeah, and then the progress has been fantastic. But we also have to remember, I mean, I know this is where I have a little bit of, you know, Dan and I both circulate in the London bubble. Um, yes. and, and this podcast exactly. will be heard by people who are who work, potentially work in some pretty blue collar sort of factories and sort of some very specific sort of areas in different parts of the country, which are not as, you know, uh, so sort of socially, not socially forward, uh, not being derogatory, but, you know, don't don't have those visibility, don't see people and don't, you know, see have the visibility of, you know, queer people as much in their society so therefore you know somebody who wanted to use you know sort of gender neutral uniforms or you know you know present in a completely different way you know is is are they going to be safe in that area so what is back to story doing with its clients with its you know customers with its you know its, its sort of information to support that person to so make sure that that if they experience anything at work through a client base as well that's that's obviously followed up and dealt with um but yeah we london leads the way is, is a thing and that sounds very london centric and there'll be people rolling their eyes at that i'm sure of, but unfortunately that's the case there is but we need to make sure that, you know, especially this is why we set up Shine to have regional you know, chairs and regional hubs so that we can make sure that each area has some representation and can keep growing and can be looking at what it means to be, you know, a queer individual in a different part of the world. You know, our chair up in Aberdeen in Scotland, you know, yeah. what does it mean? What does it mean for them up there to be able to sort of, you know, be themselves Ooh. and to bring Scottish people along with them? So, you know, there's a lot of work that's done really well, but we have to make sure we keep on with it. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, there is definitely more visible representation in specific cities scattered across the UK. Um, and I suppose the the one thing that I, I imagine really helps with that is the role that ESGs and inclusion groups play and, you know, particularly shine within Baxter Story uh, and dive in and rise. Um, you know, I'd like to know from you a little bit more about how the role you feel ESGs and inclusion groups do play in creating more tangible resource for leaders in areas where they don't have as much resource as we do in London? I guess ESGs to me, I mean, I, I'll take a quick rugby example, going back to that, and I work with um, England Rugby, the RFU, their staff have their Proud Roses, which is their you know LGBTQ plus inclusion group. And, and they've had a really tough time over the last few years. You know, England Rugby brought in a um, gender participation policy, which means that transgender women can no longer play contact rugby. Um, and that sort of has followed on from a number of pieces that's happened through sort of sport in general. We've seen a lot of it on the press. We've seen a lot of it in terms of some of the culture wars that have been stirred up. We're seeing a lot of it in terms of the areas and work that we're, you know, that sport's doing. But that group has had to work really hard to sort of identify their space and to work on how they are, can still influence their the sport and influence their their bosses who are the leaders of the rfu to then be able to sort of make sure that they still stand up and say okay well whilst we are very aware of this uh specific policy you know we still have to make sure that we are in the room and we're talking and we're looking at how that can be worked with reversed changed over time but mm -hmm. also make sure the rest of the community is still represented in the decision making that goes on mm -hmm. and that's going to be the same in in sort of in terms of Back to the story, we saw it with Rise having real impact on the new benefits package that came through. But, you know, Shine is going to move into that stage now where it needs to be consulted and, and worked with and work and support changes that come to sort of working conditions, changes that come to, you know, sort of, you know, the sort of general policies, the language that's used within documents and, you know, campaigns and items that Back to the Story does. And that's what an ESG can really do. But again, it's also a round table. Hopefully we'll have some social side to it and allow people to say have a sense of belonging, you know, and especially regionally where we've set up these little these hubs and we get people sort of growing those hubs locally. Okay. Are we ready for a, a quick lightning round? In one word, an LGBTQI plus in culture inclusive culture is safe. Future. 
<laughs> one tip you have for leaders to sustain an inclusive culture right now? Question. Ask questions. Yeah. How will you be celebrating Pride Month? Ooh. Champagne. What are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Can I come play with you? Can we go out? <laughs> we'll go do something i'm sure champagne there you go. You, Matt. excellent there you go champagne <laughs> oh nice okay i'm there too <laughs> and i said just one last long question you know we're all aware and we talked a little bit about it in the uk but in the wider world there are real challenges that are impacting our community and the rights of people to live their authentic selves and for some people this can feel like a really dark time um i want you to let people know what keeps your torch alight for a brighter and more inclusive future Creating, I, I, my world, I love creating an environment or having an impact on an environment and everything you can do to be able to do that and watching people prosper and grow in it is a joy. Um, so my my charge, my, my lead on it is to ensure we get a really diverse workforce um, and representational. The perspectives that you're going to get, the perspectives that we possibly haven't considered because we don't have those voices there. And the more voices that we have, the more we can change and the more we can then create a, um, a business that prosper from it as well. It's mm. soundly known that businesses prosper financially. They they open their markets up to different markets. Uh, there's so many different things that can benefit from all of it, but we can't see it yet because we're not there. But we're starting to get towards it and you're starting to feel it. So that's the excitement for me now is it feels like traction happening. It feels like things are moving in the right direction. It's, it's things you've scratched your head about for years and gone, is this actually ever going to change? And it yeah. is in our lifetime. So incredibly powerful that it's moving in the right direction. So that, that's, that's my goal. I think keeping, the, keeping the, the spark alive for me, I think it's a constant process of renewal. It can be for those those who sort of put their head above the parapet and want to sort of campaign and, and ask for things, it can be exhausting. You know, a lot of us do this as a we're recording this on the, during our daytime, but ultimately this is extra to our to our day job. So, mm. you know, it, it can be absolutely exhausting, and we have to make sure we look after those who do put their head above the parapet. But mm. you know, I, I I get every so often I get another burst of renewal and, and I had this last week where I was in Rome for the Gay Rugby World Cup, the Bingham Cup, with my team, the King's Cross Steelers mm. were there. Uh, and one of the sort of key pieces of the for finals day was a uh, international barbarians transgender player game. And they, they had two teams, or they had, in fact, they had three teams in terms of numbers uh, of transgender players from around the world who came together to play a 40 minute barbarians game. Um, and, you know, for some uh, transgender women who can't play in England anymore or Scotland or Wales or Ireland or other countries, mm -hmm. they got to play rugby again, which they've not been allowed to do for a couple of years. And they were mixed in with sort of a player of mine who's a transgender male who plays on my team, who is 19 um, and was the best player on the pitch. And is just phenomenal. And he was just he scored a try and converted. And I had a real proud dad moment there where I was crying inside wow. the pitch, you know, wanting uh, wanting you know the success to happen. But that, that that's renewed me again, because ultimately I stood there and watched us and everybody worries about sort of the, the gender piece and transgender penny pool and sport. Um, should watch that game and see that nobody nobody was injured, nobody got hurt, nobody had died. You know, everyone has played rugby, had fun, enjoyed themselves, and the joy that was expressed, and then also the support from the community for them afterwards was was just beautiful thing to see. Um, and there's a link to the games if people want to watch it. I can get it shared so people can watch those games um, from the World Cup, and it was yeah. it was just a wonderful thing. But I think I think you have to find ways to keep renewing yourself, and, and we all have to keep finding ways to because it can be become a, a, a struggle and I sit in some of the old council chambers at the RFU and wonder why I'm still there doing it and what, what impact am I having and I think we all need to make sure we look after those who support each other and, and, and lift each other up as well but yeah so the spark has is constantly has to be renewed to answer your question so find the things that renew it do things that are going to renew it um, and support those who are stepping forward because you can feel very lonely and uh, you know and, and isolated sometimes so we have to make sure that we uh, are shining a light to use a uh, <laughs> to use some sort of cliche pun uh, to, on, on the people that do do the work so that they get um, renewed regularly. Wow, what a conversation! I definitely feel renewed. <laughs> so thank you for both Dan and Matt. 
for being part of the first ever Shine Takeover episode on FYI, the Backstory podcast for Pride Month. And for those listening, we hope you found valuable insights from hearing these unique perspectives and are taking away some actions to consider in both creating and fostering and keeping alive a more LGBTQI plus inclusive culture. If you enjoyed today's discussion, don't forget to subscribe to our Spotify channel for more engaging conversations and stay tuned for upcoming episodes. Keep shining. <laughs>